the site. And he was, again, within 50 feet of this aeronautics engineer. He described him as having a beak, a crest, uh, leathery wings, hands on his wings, a tail, grayish brown in color. Now, the paleontologist in the audience will realize that this is a description of a Ramphorhynchid pterodactyl. And according to standard evolutionary interpretation, these creatures saw their demise 225 million years ago. We had here multiple sightings, including school teachers and uh, policemen, of what they described as flying, giant flying lizards, pterodactyls, flying in the daytime even, which is unusual for pterodactyls because they tend to be apparently a nocturnal type of animal. And these pterodactyls flying along the Rio Grande. Their favorite food is decaying human flesh. And literally some of their funerals have been interrupted by these creatures trying to steal the corpse out of the casket. Now these are very vivid descriptions. Some of the most interesting and credible reports come out of Namibia, a remote country in southwest Africa that's mostly desert. In Namibia, people whom I trust have reported to me that there is an area where a breeding population of pterodactyls still exists today. There is no way that you can account for creatures such as this being alive today and have 225 million years of time involved. Uh, creatures like Mokelium bimbi of the Congo that are matched specifically by the description of a quadrupedal dinosaur such as Brachiosaurus with a large body, long tail, long neck, and small head, uh, having been described by the nationals in the Congo within recent years. Finding creatures like this or the possibility of having creatures alive like this today means that the time has to be compressed drastically. And we're not talking about those millions of years of evolutionary time. How can we explain evidence of man and dinosaurs living at the same time? The theory of cataclysmic geology suggests that the Earth could be much younger than we think throwing into question our whole system of dating. It's often said that the dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. You might ask, uh, well, is this a scientific fact? The truth is, this is not a scientific fact. This is a theory, a scientific theory, and one based on the uniformitarian dating of geological strata. The kind of geology we're taught today is a geology called uniformitarian geology. And this is the school of geology which tells us that geological change is very slow. It happens over millions of years. We can see the kind of changes. And therefore, when we have layers of strata, we then create a, a period of time that's vast in scope, covering millions and millions of years. Yet the same strata in the opposing theory of geology which is called cataclysmic geology, that same strata can build up not over millions of years, but in just a few years, or even in a matter of days. Fossils then, and the geological strata that we, we find them, are simply assumed to have accumulated over millions and millions of years. When animals die in a natural setting, they do not become fossils. A good example of this would be in the early 1800s, Buffalo Bill and his buddies went out to the Great Plains of America and slaughtered hundreds of thousands of buffalo, cut their tongues out and left them on the Great Plains to rot and die. Well, they were already dead. What happened to those buffalo? Did any of those buffalo ever become a fossil? No. Not one will ever be a fossil. And that is because when, when things die, they decay and go to dust. And when you bury a dog in your backyard, he's not going to become a fossil either. What it takes to have a fossil, whether it's a dinosaur fossil or a petrified wood or anything like this, we've got to have some cataclysmic event that has not only killed that animal, but buried it under tons of gravel or volcanic ash or dirt in some landslide. The very mechanism 
that causes and creates fossils is the same mechanism that causes the extinction of these animals. And that is cataclysmic changes. So as we look at fossils, we start to see that they themselves are indicative of these cataclysms of the past. And now we can also begin to look at geological dating in a different way. On the face of it, um, an artifact, a human artifact, found in a layer of rock which seems to be millions of years old is an inexplicable anomaly. It's not so inexplicable if the strata isn't millions of years old and if the dating method that's being used is in fact inaccurate. And I suspect that in many cases that's exactly what has happened in recent years. The chief radioactive dating method that's used to date the Earth is the uranium-lead method. Uranium radioactive mineral turns into lead over a long, long period of time. You measure the amount of uranium in the Earth's crust, you measure the amount of lead. That tells you, or that at least conventional scientists say, that tells you how old the Earth is. Now, the figure that you arrive at when you use that technique is 4,500 million years. However, what they haven't mentioned is that uranium also turns into another substance. It turns into a distinctive form of helium, radioactive helium. In fact, practically all the radioactive helium in the Earth's atmosphere has come from radioactive decay. Now, if this method was reliable, if you measured the age of the helium in the atmosphere, it would give you the same age, 4,500 billion years. In fact, it doesn't give you an age anything like that. It gives you an age just a couple of hundred thousand years. Now, it seems to me that any technique for dating, which on one hand gives you an age of four and a half billion years, but on the other hand gives you an age of just a couple of hundred thousand years, that technique has to be at least very unreliable. The dating anomalies and the evidence which contradicts uh, the reliability of dating is being ignored by scientists on the whole because they'd have to restructure their whole theory of the age of the Earth. It would mean really starting from scratch. For example, the rate at which coal is formed is still controversial. The conventional idea is that coal is formed very slowly over millions of years and that basically it's age that determines the formation of coal. In fact, there's quite a bit of evidence in the field that coal might be produced from wood by pressure alone. For example, uh, modern timber pilings and bridges have turned into a, a low rank of coal. Um, the Ohio, Ohio coal seam in the United States, the rank of the coal increases as you get as the coal goes further and further underground, as the pressure increases. So it seems that there is some evidence that pressure alone might generate coal in a relatively short space of time. Now, if coal can be produced relatively rapidly, what about the other rocks of the Earth's crust? Perhaps they could be formed relatively rapidly as well. This is complete heresy. This is one thing that orthodox geologists would not accept. And yet there is mounting evidence that some types of rock can be formed very quickly in catastrophic conditions. The rocks behind me are thought to be 65 million years old, and they're thought to have been formed by processes that work very, very slowly over immense periods of time. But they could equally have been formed relatively rapidly by cataclysmic processes. Darwinists prefer the first interpretation because it's consistent with their interpretation of immense antiquity for life on Earth. The Earth could conceivably be younger than the four and a half billion years that it's customarily taken to be. And if that's the case, then there has been much less time available for life to evolve on Earth. And the Darwinian mechanism, which requires billions of years to work, is looking far less probable. The theory of evolution is so popular today that few dare to question it. In one sense, you can understand people's reluctance to drop Darwinism because apart from the fact that it's an attractive theory, there is also a scientific principle. It's called the principle of tenacity, that you shouldn't junk ideas just because a few anomalies have come along. The trouble is that the anomalies with Darwinism are so enormous that they're now greater than the theory itself. And so we should start questioning this principle of tenacity. We should start questioning, should we be hanging on to this theory regardless? The key problems with Darwin's theory are that, quite simply, there isn't any really solid empirical evidence. It's conjecture on conjecture, supposition on supposition. They're all very plausible, they're very rational suppositions, very rational conjectures, but they are still conjectures. And I find it ironic that for most of this century, Darwinists have acted and spoken as if they had already delivered conclusive proof to us of their theory. Well, in fact, 
that's the last thing they've done. There is no conclusive evidence of Darwinism. The evidence seems solid, but it's